join me in the call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. What Israel said. righteous shall enter through it. This is the way that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. Okay, the pulpit's a little tall for me. <laughs> if we belong to Christ, it is all God's doing. God has given the Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts. Let us pray. Oh God, we confess our distress. God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting.
So I have a request this morning for uh, special prayers for member Lucy Crane. Uh, she's not been doing well and has asked for your prayers. So please uh, keep her in your prayers. And now will you join me uh, in prayer? Loving God, we give you thanks for your son Jesus, whom we confess as our Lord. You sustain us by his word. When we grow weary in our faith, you have caused your commandments to pervade his life, giving focus and a direction to our attempts to do your will. When we stumble and fall, it is he who intercedes on our behalf. He is our righteousness and our redeemer, our source of hope and the author of faith. He suffered rejection, endured the cross so that we can approach you with boldness and with acceptance through his promise of new life. He is indeed the name above all names, the one who enables and frees us to proclaim your glory. May our prayers of thanksgiving breed endurance as we offer our lives to others in Christ's name. There are those whose energies are sapped by sorrow, whose bodies are bent by grief. Empowered by your Holy Spirit, we seek to infuse them with hope. There are others who are not accepted by their neighbors, cast aside as being inferior or of no use. Encouraged by your forgiveness in Christ, let our words of acceptance offer them comfort and rest. Keep us, we pray, from compounding the pain that is inflicted on your people, whatever the cause. Christ made the perfect sacrifice once and for all. May we live in his name, and may we show compassion to all who suffer. Holy God, Jesus Christ spoke your word of peace to a sinful world, brought us the gift of rest, reconciliation by the suffering and death that he endured. Teach us who bear his name to follow the example that he gave us. May our faith, hope, and charity turn hatred to love, conflict to peace, and death to eternal life. Eternal God, bring com to completion your saving work so that the whole world may see the fallen lifted up, the old made new, and all things brought to perfection through him who made all things new, our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for our nation. O oh God, as we read and hear the scriptures, grant us further insight and understanding of the living word, Jesus the Christ. Gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wastes away from grief, my soul and body also. I am the scorn of all my adversity, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. of many, terror all around, as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors.
Our epistle reading this morning comes to us from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 through 11. Listen now to the word of God. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was made in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bend in heaven and on earth, and every tongue should confess Jesus Christ is Lord of God the Father. Amen. Second um, reading is a little bit long, but that's okay because it's Palm Sunday. It's from uh, the Gospel of Mark, the 15th chapter verses 1 through 39. Listen again for God's word to you. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and with the whole council. They bound Jesus and led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges are being brought against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone whom they asked for. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered me, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have them release Barabbas for them instead and Pilate spoke to them again then what do you wish me to do with the man you call king of the Jews they shouted back crucify him Pilate asked them why what evil has he done but they shouted all the more crucify him so Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him to the courtyard of the place that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him, Hail the King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and then they let him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming from the country to carry the cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. And they offered him a mix of wine and myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what, who should take what. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. And they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, 
Ah, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three, three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthia, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Well, I don't know about all of you, how things have been here, but the last year has been pretty tough for me. Uh, let me give you a little uh, background because I think that you should know a little bit about the fellow who's standing up here preaching to you on Palm Sunday. Um, for almost 13 years, I was the pastor at Faith Presbyterian Church, which is in Southwest Jefferson County in Valley Station. If any of you have been involved in the Presbytery, you know the church closed in July of last year. I'm also the intensive care unit chaplain at University of Louisville Hospital. And you may have heard of a little thing called COVID. That's uh, had a profound effect on how we do our jobs uh, at the hospital. The good news, I think, is that we've seen to turn the corner finally on this pandemic. And so we are here at the beginning of Holy Week, which is the beginning of the end of Jesus' journey to the cross. And I think most of us are ready to put this long season of COVID suffering behind us. And I know that reflecting on Jesus' passion at this point in our history might be the last thing any of you want to do. Especially in light of the other narratives our collective ears and hearts have been forced to ingest. The protests this summer over George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, which hit very close to home for those of us in Louisville. And just last week, the victims of mass shootings in Atlanta and Colorado. So I think the words of our psalm for this week are particularly poignant. My eye washes, wastes away from grief my soul and body also, for my life is spent with sorrow, my years with sighing, my strength fails because of my misery, and my bones waste away. There are far too many among us whose strength has failed and whose bones have wasted away, not necessarily because of disease, but because of grief, sorrow and misery. The affliction that is currently afflicting us migrates over to our actual bodies 
which break down under its cruel and relentless assault of sin and death. And yet, the liturgy of this day, this Passion and Palm Sunday, turns our eyes to Jesus, this man of suffering who is acquainted with infirmity. And when you think about it from one angle, Jesus' suffering is uh, unremarkable given the time. He's but one man among innumerable hosts of bodies pulverized by the cruel machinery of human violence. We human beings have found many ways to hurt one another. And the reasons for his suffering are all too recognizable, even two millennia later. Betrayal, abandonment, unfair justice, physical abuse, and mob justice. But for Mark, in his gospel, Jesus is not only a victim. Jesus' event, death, was an apocalyptic occurrence. The Greek word, apocalypsis, simply means revelation. And the suffering of Jesus was revelatory in several ways. It exposed things around him for what they really were. Starting with his closest relationship, Jesus' disciples and friends were unable to stick with him in his hour of greatest need. His suffering revealed the fragility of his friends' loyalty and courage. His death also exposed the profound cruelty of those with social and governmental power. Does that seem familiar to anyone? In Jesus' suffering, we can see the dangerous synergy that can occur between a corrupt state, power, and mob justice. The power of Jesus' trial exposed how the legal system of his time could be manipulated to serve corrupt interests. To the small number of people, Jesus' suffering also revealed his identity as the Messiah. The woman who anointed Jesus' feet with expensive perfume earlier in this gospel recognized Jesus' coming death in a way that nobody else in the room could. And when Jesus took his last breath, an unnamed Roman centurion puts it all together. Truly, this was God's son. Jesus' identity as Savior only became apparent at the moment of his death and to the most unlikely of people. It's humbling to realize that most of Jesus' contemporaries were unable to comprehend his mission even when Jesus stated it explicitly. The Gospel of Mark shows us that the disciples are dense and it gives me a great deal of hope because I can be pretty dense sometimes. They just didn't get it. But Jesus death was also apocalyptic in another way because it marked a new chapter in God's redemptive drama this turning of the page in the darkening of the sky and the reading, rending of the temple curtain in the breaking apocalyptic age is also apparent in the context of Mark Jesus' passion takes place over eight days including Passover itself. This chronological setting makes the Exodus an important theological and literary backdrop to this story. When darkness falls across the land, in Mark 15, 33, for instance, one is reminded of the plague of darkness in Exodus 10, followed by the death of the firstborn in Egypt in Exodus 11. And the upshot of all this is that Jesus' own suffering is part of a larger story. 
of liberation, effected in this case by the death of the Son of God rather than the firstborn of Egypt. As we reflect on the evils in our own present age, it becomes readily apparent that we're still waiting. We're still waiting for the Son of Man to arrive on the clouds with great power and glory. Jesus' ancient command to keep awake remains an imperative for those of us who claim the faith of Christianity. But the absence of Christ's glory does not mean we are left without God's power. In this age of darkness, power appears to us in the form of weakness, in the gift of healing that comes wrapped in the garbs of suffering. The passion of the Christ in the Gospel of Mark makes the strange and mysterious claim that the spilled blood of Jesus contains the gift of a new covenant. And as we pivot from Lent to Holy Week, we set down our Lenten crosses and direct our gaze to the cross of Christ, where we find the clearest expression of God's love, compassion, and hope for our world. May that be what each of you finds during this holiest of weeks. Amen.
And now let us uh, affirm our faith uh, together uh, with the insert in your bulletin, which I don't have. The Apostles' Creed, okay. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Uh, I'm trying to remember how you guys do offering. I think you just leave it in the back, right? Okay. And so we're to our closing hymn. We'll listen to the Academy of Visitors play through one entire stanza and then we'll sing.
world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint of heart. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord. With the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. this that was really wonderful I've had my vaccinations I'm so frustrated with still wearing these things <laughs> but uh, anyway we appreciate you being with us look forward to you being back with it look forward to you being back with us again next week yeah um, it's it was about